Hi there, my name is Alec Moore, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction to using machine learning in Unity. A bit about myself, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Central Florida, and I study virtual reality and machine learning. So let's get started. So first, what is machine learning? Uh, I'm going to cover this just because this is more geared towards people who are familiar with Unity and not familiar with machine learning. So machine learning is broadly the capability for systems to acquire their own knowledge by extracting patterns from raw data. Some common examples you're probably familiar with are optical character recognition, like digitizing books, or natural language processing, such as translating or understanding language. So when you ask your digital assistant to do something for you, add something to a calendar, the system needs to understand what you're trying to do and interpret that meaning and do it. So Machine learning is the key ingredient to actually being able to understand what you're saying. Now, modern machine learning approaches benefit greatly from large amounts of data. A lot of approaches that exist and are still in heavy use right now were actually developed in the 80s through the early 90s, and they weren't really useful at the time because there was not a large amount of data that they could be trained on. But now with uh, just huge volumes of data, we can refine these same techniques to much greater effect. So basically, here's the outline of how we're going to do this. Um, I'm, we're going to start with a fresh Unity project. We're going to install the Barracuda inferencing package. This is Unity Engine's new machine learning inferencing package. It's really cool. We're going to download the MNIST 8 model from the Onyx Model Zoo. Then we're going to make a script to use the model. We're going to create a test image to see if that works. Then we're going to make a script to draw onto a texture in Unity. Then I'm gonna cover some possible next steps for you. So let's get started in Slideshow. All right, so I'm gonna create a new project. I'm gonna call it Inferencing Tutorial. If this takes a while, I will do a jump cut. And we're back. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started on downloading the Barracuda package. That's the next step. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to open up the package manager window and we're going to add from a git URL. So in this case, I already have the git URL on my paste, but um, I'll show you where you can find that. So if you go to GitHub Unity Technologies Barracuda release, and I'll include a link for this in the description, you can basically just add .git to the end, and that'll get you the actual release itself. And there we go. Okay, so now we have Barracuda from the git URL, which is great. So this is the 2.2.1 preview. Now, depending on your version of Unity and when you're viewing this, you might be able to just add it by going to Unity Registry and selecting Barracuda from this dropdown. But right now, my version of Unity, I don't have that. But if you have that, it might be an easier way to do this. So we have Barracuda installed. If we check down here in packages, we can see that Barracuda is right there. And so that means that we're now ready to do some inferencing. But first, we need to figure out what model we're going to use. So. In machine learning, you usually train models and then you use models. Um, in our case right now, we're just going to use a pre-trained model from the internet. So I'm going to get this from the Onyx Model Zoo here. So this can be found on GitHub also. GitHub Onyx Models, and then it's the MNIST 8 Onyx file. And so you can go ahead and download that. I've already downloaded it. And I will copy that right into my project in just a moment. Okay, so I've created a new folder in here. I've called it models, and I've put the MNIST 8 neural network model in there. So you'll see there are some options here that let you see some information about how the model works. In this case, uh, we can see some information about the input shape. This means that it takes in a, basically one object with a height and a width of 28. So that's gonna be useful for us to know. And so now that we've got the model, we need to actually program something to make use of it. So I'm going to create a new folder, scripts, 
I'm going to create a new C sharp script and we're going to call it uh, get inference from model. Okay. All right, and so I have a cheat sheet here. I'm going to be upfront, but I'm going to cover a couple of things. So first of all, we need to create a reference to this model. So the way that you can do this in Barracuda is there are a couple of different options, but one nice way that I'm just going to use for this case is we're going to first have a public in model model asset and we'll need to import the Barracuda. Um, I'm also going to use link by the way so uh, just so you're aware. And you don't have to use link. Um, I just find it to make everything a lot easier. So we're going to have our neural network model. This is going to be the asset that we actually reference. We're also going to need a uh, private model that's the actual like internal model that's used at runtime. And then we'll also need a private iWorker. And that's going to be what actually runs the model and dispatches jobs to the model. So then this is going to be what runs our stuff, but we also need to describe the input. Now in the case with Barracuda, this is really cool. You don't actually have to do any modifications to something if it's already as a texture. So you can just have a texture be your input. So we're going to do that. We're going to do a public texture 2D texture. And so that's going to be what's actually going to be the input for our stuff. So there's our input. Here's how we're running things. And now we also need to have the output. And so for the time being, we're just going to make a struct that we can use. And so I'm going to do that by setting up um, just a public struct. And it's going to be serialized so that we can see it in the editor. So. Need to do something for serializable, apparently. OK. And we're going to do public struct. I'm just going to call it prediction. So we're going to have a public int predicted value. This is going to be the value that our model predicts. Then we're going to have a public float list of sorry, array of predicted. And then we're also going to have a setter. So we're going to do public void set prediction tensor. Sorry, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna take in a tensor T. And so don't be frightened by what uh, tensor is. It's essentially, you can just think of it as another structure for programming, but in essence, it's an n-dimensional array or matrix. So if you think about it, an array is usually one dimensional and a matrix is usually two dimensional. A tensor just has any number of dimensions that can vary. So it's kind of like if you had a three dimensional matrix, you can, you can extrapolate it. So we're going to set our predicted float array as the t as floats. I'm going to get the value, and that's going to be, this is why we're using link, by the way. Which Interestingly, C Sharp doesn't have an argmax function built in. Uh, Unity doesn't have an argmax in its mathf library. So I'm aware that this is technically roughly big O one and a half ish in. <laughs> so, um, and you can do this in big O n, but I find this to be readable. 
And so that's what we're doing. It's pretty clear. The index of the maximum, it's, it's, it's essentially what argmax is. So, okay. So we've got our prediction data structure and now we can do public prediction prediction. And so now when I pull up Unity, we should see, let's see, we need to actually create an object to put our inferencing script on. So let me create an empty, do inferencing, pop that on there. And so now we'll see we've got a spot for the texture, we've got a spot for the model asset, and then we've got the predicted value and the list. So I'm gonna go back to that and fix that spelling error because I saw that. There we go. And now we're going to start, quite literally, in the start function. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to load up our runtime model with the asset model. So we're gonna do that by calling model loader dot load. It's well named. And then we need to set up the engine. So that's going to come from the worker factory. So engine equals worker factory, create worker. And then I think we want to do, let's see. So I'm going to do device GPU. Yeah. Um, so another aside here. One cool thing about Barracuda is that it's designed to be fairly cross-platform. So Onyx ONNX stands for Open Neural Network Exchange, I believe. Open Neural Network something. Um, the whole point of it is that you can take your built neural networks that you've trained or your machine learning models and you can make them portable so that they can execute on other things. Barracuda is very cool because it takes these models and it's able to pass them into a texture that runs on your GPU. And so you're actually doing a compute shader essentially running these neural networks. So, and then we'll also instantiate our prediction. So that basically finishes up what we have for the start. And so now finally we need to tell it to actually infer what we've given it. So I'm just gonna put this inside of a uh, get key down and that's just gonna be a spacebar. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to decide a channel count. So that's gonna be channel count equals one. So this is gonna be because we're going to be making a tensor out of a grayscale texture. And so then our input X is going to be a new tensor texture and channel count. So in this case, one is just going to be uh, grayscale, uh, three is gonna be color, and four is gonna be color plus alpha, just for your reference. So now we've got our grayscale tensor, and this is basically the same way that the MNIST data takes its information in. And we're going to set up our output tensor. So tensor output y. And then here's where we're actually going to run something. engine.execute input x. And then peak output. So a brief note, so peak output is going to examine the contents of the buffer and pull it into memory temporarily. And that's gonna be more efficient and it won't waste your memory and you won't have to worry about garbage collection, but at the cost of the fact that if you run execute again, these values are gonna change out from under you. So 
in general, this is the way that I would approach using it. And I would just take it immediately, figure out what I need to find out from it, and then use that information. If you want to make a copy of the tensor, then you're going to need to use a different function. And then when you're done with it, you're going to need to manually destroy it because I believe the garbage collector doesn't pick that up. Uh, that should be detailed on the Barracuda Getting Started webpage, which I'll include a link to. So we've got our output Y, and so now we just need to prediction, set prediction, output Y. There we go. Okay, cool. So this is pretty much everything that we need. Hi, right, so future Alec here. Actually, it's not everything. We actually need to manage some of the memory ourselves. So one more thing that we need to do here is we need to take this input X because we call a new on it. It's not actually going to be collected by the garbage collector. So once we execute on it, we're going to go ahead and manually dispose of it. So input x dot dispose and then the worker itself um, needs to be manually disposed as well and so we can just do that in the on destroy function so I'm going to add that now that's going to be engine dot dispose and I think let's see we put a there we go. All right, and that should do it. Yeah, that's that's what you need to do now. So basically, we create new inputs every time, new input tensors, but they need to actually be manually disposed of, and then the engine itself needs to be manually disposed of. The output doesn't need to be disposed of because we're only peaking the output. We aren't making a local copy of that. Let's go back to the actual model here. And let's look at it. So if you recall here, the height and the width of the input is 28 by 28. Now I know from personal experience that that 28 by 28 is in the form of floats or singles. I forget, one of the two. <laughs> anyway. It's a single channel and it is going to be a 28 by 28 image. So let's go ahead and create an image to use for that. So I'm just gonna probably leave that in the top level here, but let me open up GIMP and create a new. And I already have the image size filled in here. So like I said, 28 by 28 pixels, hit okay. I'm gonna fill this up with just black. And then I'm gonna go ahead and literally take a paintbrush here and I'm gonna draw um, a number. I think, uh, let's draw a five. I've had decent luck with that before. So there we go. That looks like a five, right? Okay. So I'm going to export this to inferencing tutorial assets and I'm just gonna name it five for now. And I'm just using the default settings. And so now when I come back here, here it is. And so now we need to make a couple of changes here. So first of all, it's not sRGB, no alpha. We don't want it to do power of two. So basically, if we have it set to, to nearest, it's going to pad some extra information to make it a 32 by 32. And this is useful for mip mapping, which if you're not familiar with mip mapping, that's just the process of scaling the quality for different distances. So we don't want that because we're not using it as a texture, at least not right now. So make sure that streaming mip maps is unchecked. I'm going to check read write enabled because we're gonna use that soon. Uh, not virtual texture only, don't generate mip maps. And I think, let's see, oh, and format, we're going to set it to R8. And that's going to be single channel, eight bits per pixel. So I hit apply and now it looks red, that's fine. That just means that that's the only channel there. So it's just rendering it as red. 
Okay, cool. So now we've got a texture that we can look at and we've got our model or we've got our script to access the model here. So let's take the texture and put, plug that right in. That's named five. We're going to pull up our model, plop that right in there. And now I believe if I just, let me lock this editor. If I hit play, theoretically what should happen now is I should be able to hit spacebar and it should change the predicted value to five and it should give us information about how likely it thinks all of the other numbers are. So there we go. So the predicted value for this was five. So that's great. That's what we were hoping for. And we can see now also, this is what the model thinks. This is how likely the model thinks other numbers are. So it actually thinks it almost looks kind of like a three, which I have to agree. It does almost look kind of like a three. It also thinks it maybe looks a little bit like a nine too. And I think that that's not too wrong. But the number that it thinks is most likely is five, and that's correct. So there you go. That is the very beginnings of actually using a machine learning model inside of Unity. And as you saw, that we were able to do this in runtime and feed it data live. Now to get bonus points on this, what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this five here. So I'm just going to, well, I'm going to go back to GIMP here. I'm going to fill everything in with black. And we're going to save it as blank right there. Again, same default settings. And then again, we're going to go back here to import settings. We're going to do the same changes. None, read, write enabled, don't generate bitmaps, mitmaps, and R8. I'm going to hit apply. So now these should both be the same. Cool. So we now have our 28 by 28 blank canvas here. We're going to, in the scene, let's just spin up a top-down view, and we're going to create a new plane. So there we go. Here's our plane. And then we're going to let it automatically create a material for us that's going to have blank on it. And we're just going to let it have the standard shader. Seems fine. Um, maybe we can lower the smoothness a little bit. There we go. OK. So now we've got a plane. We've got. Uh, stuff here. I'm going to make the main camera move to my current view. So there we go. And so now when we hit play, it'll be right here. And then in do inference, in do inferencing, we're going to just set this to blank now. So if, if we ran it, it would probably give us some garbage because garbage in, garbage out. So let's make a script to make this a little bit more useful. So we're going to create a new script. And this is going to be called, I'm going to call it draw on texture. And this is going to be a lot more, this, this part here now is just a lot more interface kind of stuff. This is a lot more like game making stuff. This is a lot less machine learning. So basically I'm going to set up a game object that's going to be our drawing plane. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to put this on the drawing plane, so I don't need to explicitly have a reference to that. But I'm going to get a reference to the texture. There we go. We don't actually need a start function here. And then in update, I'm just going to have this as a separated out function because I might at some point want to change this so that it's not using um, so that it's not using the mouse drawing by necessity, but instead update it so that it can be working on virtual reality or working with some other form of input, maybe a touch screen, what have you. So I'm just going to call this do mouse drawing. Oh, 
Uh, need to give it a thing. Oh. <laughs> okay. And this is going to allow drawing to the texture with a mouse. Pretty straightforward. And then we're also going to have an exception here. And that's just going to be a generic exception because I can't be bothered to make a whole new set of exceptions. So first off, let's just make sure that the camera isn't null. I'm going to throw a new, ugh, new exception. And that's just going to be a cannot find main camera. So that'll save us a little bit of editor yelling at me for using a camera.main that might not be instantiated. So now first let's check if there's a mouse button being pressed at all. So to do that we're just going to check if the left mouse button isn't being pressed and the right mouse button isn't being pressed, then we just return because we don't really care. We're only trying to do stuff when the button's being when one of the button is being buttons are being pressed. So once we know that a button is being pressed, then we need to set up a mouse ray from the camera. There we go. And then we're going to do that on the input uh, mouse position. Cool. So this has, um, this has the ray set up to now actually cast into the scene. And now we just need to set up our ray cast hit. And now we need to check if it's actually hitting something and if it's hitting us or the plane in this instance. So and then we want to put that out into the hit turn. So do nothing if we aren't hitting anything. And then also we're gonna have um, if all right, this isn't necessary. Okay. There we go. So now we won't do anything if we aren't clicking on anything, and we also won't do anything if this object isn't being clicked on. I'm sure there are better ways to do this, but this works. So now we're going to get our hit texture coordinates, and then we're going to multiply it by the texture width and height. And then finally, we're going to uh, set up which color we want to actually color it. So let's see. So here I'm going to use a ternary statement. Some people don't like them because they're a little bit less legible, but here I think it's pretty clear what's going on. If it's mouse button zero or the left mouse button that's being pressed, we want the color to be white. And if it's not, in this case, it would have to be the other mouse button, then we want it to be color black. So there we go. And by the way, this is going to show up as red on the texture just because it's set to 8-bit red instead of RGB, but that's fine. It'll be able to interpret it all the same. So now base texture set pixel. So here we're going to set the actual X and Y values 
with a new color. So it's going to be pixel uv dot x y and color to set. And then finally, we're going to apply that. So that's going to write that back out to the texture. And generally, this might not be the most efficient way to do this. Um, I would maybe double check before you put this in something that's huge, but I think that this will get the point across. So now we've got our function that does the mouse drawing. It lets you left click onto the object to draw in white, and it lets you right click on the object to draw in black. So now we're gonna go back to here, and we're going to add our draw on texture script to the plane. There we go. And we're going to set the base texture to blank. And so now both the plane and the do inferencing script are using the same texture here. So now when I hit play, what we'll see is this blank texture down here is going to update in real time. Ah, it's upside down. So I'm going to rotate this plane by 180 degrees real fast but you'll see that it actually persists the changes because it's writing that back out to the uh, PNG. So that's kind of cool. So now I'll hit play again, now that it is upside down. And so here I can right click to set it back to black and I can left click to set it to red. So I'm gonna do seven. And so we, we can see now we've got a nice seven. If we look down here in blank, we see that it looks kind of like a seven. It's not as thick as the five, but it looks kind of like seven. So now let me go back to do inferencing, lock that. And so now I'm gonna hit space. And as you can see, it's also got a reference to blank here. So if I hit space, it thinks it's a one. Ah, uh, that would have been nice for the video if it thought it was a seven right off the bat. But you can see that it thought it might be a seven and it looks like one just barely eked it out there and beat seven. So I'm gonna make this look a little bit more like a seven here. There we go. There we go, okay. So now it now it's pretty sure that it's a seven. We've got a score of 21 on seven and the next closest is three. So that's pretty good. I think that, um, I think that's about as, as good as we can do. So that's gonna that's gonna basically be about it. So now we've we've created an interaction that we can use to dynamically edit our scene, and we've got a model that we can access directly inside of our scene. There we go, six. We can we can play around with this all we want, um, and this model is gonna be good for identifying the digits one through nine. So. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can proceed after this point. You can go on to look at different models from the Onyx Model Zoo, which I'll have the link for in the description. Or you can look at different ways that you can use this or different ways that you can interact with this. So you could maybe make like an escape room where you have to find the numbers and then write them on a chalkboard. You could, you could literally use this as it is to write the numbers in. And that might be the kind of thing that your game might think is, or that might be the kind of thing for your game that might make people think that it's kind of cool. So with that, I'm going to sign off. Uh, thank you again for paying attention, if you paid attention. And my name is Alec Moore, uh, once again, and thanks. <laughs>